Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kellen Batum. I am very happy to present Philip Baldwin for this Knife Makers Corner this month. Um, this guy is a master bladesmith, jeweler, tool maker. Um, he's going to be coming to Swaptoberfest this year. Um, super lucky to have him. And he is going to be giving us a presentation on um, creating a sponge knife from like just a bloom of iron all the way to the final step. Um, we got Dave Lish in the panel here who's gonna be bouncing questions off of him. If you've got questions, comments, please direct them into the chat and we'll get you going. But just bear with me one second. I'm gonna share the screen. Um, okay, well, the, um, you know, the intro screen is pretty self-explanatory. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, okay. A little introduction of myself. My name is Phil Baldwin. I've been a Smith since I started smithing, teaching myself to be a Smith at age 14. It was very slow going, so it took me 10 years to pretty much get anywhere. Uh, and I was, uh, in 1967, I was 14 years old and um, went through a variety of educational experiences and after I got out of school, I became a self, more or less a self-supporting Smith with a few little diversions into uh, other jobs to keep things going. Uh, but one of my early interests was bladesmithing. And I think I was attracted to it because of the um, mythological aspect of it. And currently I'm preparing a lecture to be given at the Shokin Swordsmithing Conference in uh, Ashokin, New York um, in September called The Sword in Myth and Legend. But we're getting really, this is going to be as far as you can get from Myth and Legend. This is down and dirty, which is to say, how do you take a piece of raw smelted iron and turn it into something that you can do you can that you can do something with uh more to the point something that's going to be sharp and hold an edge and uh i met lee souter at the i believe was the 2004 abana conference which i think was in north carolina and um he asked me if i'd wanted to try this stuff out and i said oh sure by all means and so he sent me a chunk of what's called bloom iron, which is as it is when it's torn out of the furnace from smelting. And it's, I call it sponge iron because it's really pretty spongy. Um, it's a sort of an agglomeration of slag and semi-purified iron with a lot of impurities that just come along from the ore. And this is an example of what I started with, as smelted bog iron for kilos. Um, what you need to do first is compact it, next slide, into something you can do something with. Because if you just hit this and hammer it, it's like, it, it's like flies into a million different pieces. Okay, so I was using a propane forge, force draft. Want to get it pretty hot, slightly reduced in atmosphere. Historically, you used a large charcoal fire. The amount of fuel that they went through in uh, historic times would probably accounts for a lot of the deforestation that has happened. Uh, next slide, please. Next. <laughs> you I need to um, move this little window. Okay, so I'm heating, you know, I well put it on a handle because, you know, why not? <laughs> uh, the Japanese do something clever where they start out with a pre existing slab of compacted iron and then they pile this stuff on top of it with a handle on it so they can beat it into a surface. They're starting out actually with sponge steel, but their process, which is their smelting process, which is a little bit different, produces all three things, produces cast iron, steel, 
sponge seal and sponge iron. Um, anyhow, flux it, heat it as hot as it'll go. When the surface looks wet, it means that the silicaceous slag is ready to flow and therefore either act as a flux or be expelled from the piece of sponge iron. Next slide, please. You start out very gently. Okay, don't hammer it too hard because otherwise all the loose pieces or the, let's say, less congealed pieces are gonna go flying off and then you, you have to chase them all over the shop and somehow get them back into the uh, billet. And, uh, but you just start out really gently. This is all done while it looks like it's wet, which means that the slag is liquid. If it's not liquid, it's just like forge welding, stop working. Next slide, please. Okay, so you can see how it's starting to compact, but it's still this, the bloom. And I don't know why it's called a bloom, but I think it might have to do with the, the, the idea of a flower. Like, like the iron becomes a flower in the fire. Anyhow, the bloom is starting to compact. Next slide, please. And of course the handle gets loose because you're welding to something that's not terribly, uh, not terribly strong to begin with. So you have to keep on rewelding just like real life. Next slide, please. This was the person who was assisting me. His name is Pete Stevens. And this is really important. The contemporary craft movement emphasize individual craftspeople working by themselves in their studio, kind of like painters. Historically, even painters didn't work by themselves in their own studios and neither did anybody else. And so that's a big difference between contemporary craftsmen and historic craftsmen. And it's really good to keep that in mind, especially when you look at something like a halberd, which the only way to weld all those the separate elements together is with multiple people. You're not gonna do it by yourself. Unless, of course, you tack it together with a uh, arc welder first. Uh, next slide, thank you. So gradually we're compacting this. By the way, this process speeds up with time. This is the first time I had ever worked with uh, sponge iron. And I've gotten better at it since then. Uh, next slide, please. Here we go into a rough block. Okay, it's starting to get compacted. Next slide. So what we have now is, is like basically a rough first run wrought iron billet. Next slide. Got to keep on getting that slag out. A big wad of slag in in something that's relatively refined like a knife blade uh just isn't going to cut it next next okay so now we're going to get into a, a section that's going to be you can do something with okay and the next part of this process. You know, we have wrought iron right now. It's not gonna make a very good knife blade or any other sort of tool that requires hardness. Uh, so we have to make it steel from it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what you just saw took two hours and we ended up with that amount that Peter's holding right there. Next. Okay, I'm not gonna put all my eggs in one basket. I'm gonna be cautious about this. I have made, at this point, steel from wrought iron from other sources. I had never done it from blue metal. 
And so I, I did know about carburizing iron. I used a process where um, I would put the wrought iron into a sealed container like a crucible packed in charcoal and heat it for what I thought might be a good amount of time. And I can tell you more about that, you know, what is a good amount of time later because I just actually finalized it last week. Uh, next slide, please. So I use the coil because that way we can get it into a crucible and get maximum amount of surface area exposed to the charcoal dust. Uh, you want to use hardwood charcoal. Do not use mesquite charcoal because it has a very high salt content and that interferes with carburization. Next slide, please. Put it into a gas furnace, you know, basically a melting furnace. And it says for several hours. What I found was is an orange to a yellow heat which is probably about 2000 degrees in a mullite crucible packed with charcoal. You know, we're talking about about a four inch, four and a half inch wide crucible at the mouth for an hour to an hour and a half is gonna be more than sufficient to create a very high carbon steel. You gotta remember the thickness of the strip that you start out with is gonna be important. The thinner the strip, the faster it's going to carburize. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, uh, if can you I ask a question, yeah, by all means. Okay, so I guess what I'm picking up from this is the steel that you're starting with from the blue Marie uh, doesn't have enough carbon in it to make a good tool. So what you're doing right now is adding carbon to it. Yes. The process. Yes, this is called cementation. And this was the standard process for making steel in, in Europe until about 1750 when they started making cast steel. Okay. So when the Japanese did it, the steel was actually naturally infused from the coal forges they were using? Well, they weren't forges. They were, they were Tatra furnaces. And unlike the European iron where they were smelting mainly limonite i.e. I -E, bog iron or metamorphized bog iron. They're starting out with magnetite, like the iron sand. Okay, yes. And it requires a much hotter furnace and they end up with different results. It requires a, a stronger draft. Lee oh, outer does yeah, not- Great questions for me, thank you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Lee outer hates trying to smelt magnetite. His thing is, is with bog iron. Okay. Wow. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. I was kind of lost here for a minute, but you've just cleared it up because I've made the, uh, in fact, at the Western States conference, I did two bloom runs mm -hmm. of, uh, with the hematite. Right. And that so, would be, that would be in the bog iron class. It would be. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. It, it's, it's like you have red iron oxide and you have black iron oxide. And they're, they're different valences and the black iron oxide requires a much higher temperature to, to um, strip off the, uh, the oxygen from the iron. Okay, I have one last question for you. Yeah. The blooms that I made, because it's funny because I've made a bunch of this bloomery steel uh, mm -hmm. out of the hematite. I've never right. made anything out of it. The, mo the closest I've done is forge it down to some solid bars and that's where I sit right now. Right. Does do I need to add carbon to those in this process? Is or is out of the hematite? Is that going to have enough natural high carbon in it to make a knife? There's a lot of variability in all this stuff, and so what you need to do is test it. I did. Okay. I sent a sample in to get uh, and spectro analyzed. No, heat up. You know, draw out a little section. Uh -huh. Quench in water, see how hard it is. Ah, I like that, okay. How does it feel under the hammer? Sure. Okay, you know, like you can tell how much carbon is in the steel uh, or is in the iron by just the way it feels under the hammer. Sure. Really, really well. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I totally get that, I really do. 
I, uh, like I said, all, what I have is I have several pieces. I've only put like the one you showed earlier, one weld on, done. I've never done anything else with it mm -hmm. uh, because it seems like so much work and I have so much other stuff to do. Yeah. But in my dream, I would love to make a tomahawk. I would love to make a sword one day with it, but there's just never been time. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those things. So. The chances are pretty good that what you have is, now did you smelt it? in a, a shaft furnace shaft furnace with coal yeah yeah okay. with coal with coal with charcoal oh charcoal because the charcoal. two are really different okay these are this is charcoal that mesquite charcoal not mesquite. Not mesquite. no it was mesquite no it, no, it was okay. mesquite charcoal. Yeah. i have no idea how the mesquite charcoal would turn out i know that if you smell with coal or mm -hmm. coke it has a fair amount of sulfur in it, and you'll probably end up with something which which is hot short. This will hot short. It is? This will. If you leave it in the forge, it'll turn liquid. No, no, no. Hot short in the sense if you're forging at it, like, you know, like a, you know, orange or, or a yellow color. Oh, yellow yeah. Color. No, yeah. this won't do that. This will forge. This okay. will forge. And it forged pretty well, and you can you can restack it and weld it together, and it's quite stiff under the hammer, by the way. Well, then it might be it might be uh, relative, it might be steely. Mm -hmm. But you know, just go ahead and punch in water and see what happens. Thank you. I'll do that. I, I didn't mean to derail your presentation. No, no. no. There's there's that a little a little question. wrinkle. There's a little wrinkle on top of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, with smelting bog iron as opposed to the Japanese stuff. Uh, you know, iron sand or, you know, magnetite. Um, and it has to do with other impurities that are, tend to be in the iron. But I'll cover those later. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, if you heat it for too long at too hot, what happens is your iron will turn into steel and then hyper steel, and then white cast iron, and then gray cast iron, and then it'll melt and fall into the bottom crucible. And you can draw it out and say, whoopee, I made wood steel. Okay, well, that's another story, but we won't, we won't cover wood steel right now because um, that's another ball game. We're talking about cemented steel, but let's say you just heated it long enough so that the, the surface starts to get vaguely liquid, vaguely liquid, but it doesn't run. You have very, very high carbon steel at that point. Next slide, please. And this was a little bit overdone. You can see how it melted, right? You know, the surface turned liquid. I also did not fold and weld this several times to drive out even more slag, so it's very coarse material. But we have very high carbon content. Uh, next slide, please. Unroll it, forge it flat, quench the red heat. I'm going to the Japanese style where you take what is essentially a semi cast iron or very high carbon steel. And um, I added some extra iron. Next slide, piled onto a plate, forge welded together. And then start folding. Next slide. Remember, this is the first time I've ever done this. Okay. Let's go. Next slide, please. This was not the best way to do it, by the way. Next slide. By the way, the iron was from the original billet. Next slide. Now we're gonna fold and weld it. And the whole thing about folding and welding, AKA Japanese and everybody else is it's just a matter of, it's like kneading bread. It's trying to get everything pretty even. Next slide. Now it's looking actually kind of like pretty respectable right there. Next slide. Now, I had been added too much wrought iron from the bottom plate. So I took the whole thing, recarburized it, 
and again overheated because it started to turn liquid. Next slide. Oh, back again, please. Okay, see that bubble on the top, on the inside of the top bar? Yeah, right there. Okay, one of the things that cemented steel or cemented iron, which became steel, was called, was called blister steel. And the reason why it's called blister steel is that the carbon reacts with the slag in the, in the iron, if there is any, and of course there was, and makes uh, gas. I think it's CO2, which makes blisters in the iron. So again, this is one of the reasons you want to start out with relatively refined wrought iron before you even start trying to make steel. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm stacking and trying to mix everything up. Next slide. By the way, at this time, you know, because of oxidation from the forge rolling process, uh, the amount of steel there is keeps on getting smaller and smaller. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna start forging a blade. Now, in retrospect, this piece of steel was uh, not really refined enough, but what the hell? I didn't know that at the time. It seemed like it was okay. Next slide, please. Reduce the slide, you know, reduce forging temperature to refine the grain. You know, every time you heat a piece of uh, metal, the grains tend to get bigger. Uh, and the only way to make them smaller is to work the material. And small grain, sm fine grain metal is stronger than coarse grain metal. Next slide, please. For the bladesmiths, you'll see that this is all very straightforward. I did not have any decent coal at that time. So we use charcoal, natural charcoal, oak charcoal. I've never had any luck with mesquite forging it. It just, it doesn't work for me. Um, some people like it, uh, I don't. Uh, next slide. Very, very straightforward bladesmithing techniques. Side draft forge here, by the way. Um, I made a coal forge recently and I really like it, but I have to admit I'm, I'm spoiled by side draft forges. I'm gonna revamp and make a, uh, make a really a decent side draft coal forge. The charm of side draft forges is that all your slag goes past you know what it drips down and goes past the uh, air it doesn't settle right on the air inlet and clog everything up and and they are the historic the most most forges historically have been side draft forges next slide please okay reverse curve to account for making the edge thinner and the blade bends backwards um, this has changed a little bit. And since then, I figured out a different way or started forging blades differently. Uh, so a reverse curve is less important. I found that using the cross beam of the hammer to taper out the edge is actually a lot more efficient uh, than using the flat of the hammer. Uh, next slide. Forge blade. Next slide, please. Okay, normalizing. Charcoal is really, really wonderful to work with. 
I, I really recommend that anybody who works with solid fuel, at least give charcoal a try. It's really hard to get and it's really expensive, but for some things it can't be beat. Next slide, please. Okay, I went for a Japanese style heat treatment on this and that's with using the clay. And this is something I've done since the very beginning. And the mixture of clay that I use is from Yoshino Yoshihara's book, which is it's about equal parts by volume of fire clay, a very fine grout, which is like a sand and, uh, and, and ground charcoal. And this tends to stay on the blade and uh, you grind it up and, and slosh it on. And I do it in my own particular way. It's somewhat different than Japanese. And you can see the pattern that I put it on this particular blade. Uh, next slide, please. Heat it up as evenly as possible. I quenched in oil. And the reason why is because I tested quenching this particular steel in water and found out that it had, it was fairly deep hardening, which meant if I had quenched this blade in water, it would have cracked. So I quenched it in oil. Um, there are certain elements, manganese being the most significant, which you find in silicon and some other things that frequently occur in limonite or bog iron when it's smelted that increase depth hardening. The Japanese quench in water because their steel is basically just straight iron and carbon. Okay, very shallow hardening. And so they really need a water quench to get it up to, to uh, get it up to the hardness that they want. Plus they're using a, what we would call a medium high carbon steel, about 0.6. And this is very hard carbon steel, probably more like about 1% uh, carbon. Uh, next slide. That's after the oil quench. Then I temper it. And I temper it by heating it in hot oil for 350 to 400 degrees for as long as it takes to get it to the hardness that I want. Next slide. And then I test the blade, put a rough edge on it and beat the hell out of it. Or I shouldn't say beat the hell out of it, but, but try and abuse it in a way that would be most likely to be abused for the intended purpose. In this case, it was made as a kitchen knife. So, wet ground polish lightly etched with nitol, which is a 5% solution of nitric acid in ethyl alcohol. It gives a very, very clear etch and tends to bring out crystalline structure and then rub it with a fine silica powder, which is to say volcanic etch. Okay. Um, again, this is right out of Japanese swordsmithing or bladesmithing. Next slide, please. There's the hem on. I've got some nice brush strokes and sand thing going on at the very base where it was a little bit cooler. Okay, this particular sort of hem on where the transition from hard to soft steel is very, very abrupt is characteristic of high carbon steels, very high carbon steels. And that's what my blades tend to be. If you, if I made a blade like this at a drill rod, which is about the same carbon content, it would look very similar. Uh, we would not get that figure towards the base of the blade where the transition to the tank, uh, that wouldn't happen at all. Uh, if it was lower carbon, we would get a more interesting figure in it. Next slide, please. And of course, a knife without a handle isn't really that useful. And this was a tap-off type of handle. Next slide, please. 
That's the finished piece. Um, I did have to refinish this piece for a show because I used it for about a year. And, uh, you know, it acquired a used patina and then it was put in a show and it needed to be repolished. So I did. And that was easy because I could just tap off the blade and, you know, give it a light polish, a light etch, and back, move it back in business. Uh, next slide. That's beautiful, Phil. Very nice. Okay, so that was an experiment, and that was about, it was about 2005 to 2007. Um, I've learned a fair amount since then. And I'm working with now with, I'm gonna be trying to do pattern welding using high phosphorus wrought iron from Lee Souter from a high phosphorus balloon and carburized steel, you know, carburized iron. And the goal is to try and get a clear pattern, okay, without using nickel steel or without using alloy steel to, to enhance the pattern because obviously they didn't have that uh, in historic pieces. And I've heard references to this, metallurgical references, read them. I don't know if anybody has actually tried it. And we'll see what, we'll see what happens. This is an ongoing experiment right now. Um, and it's one of those things that I do when I have the time, which isn't very often. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? If nothing else, this gave me a presentation, a, a, an appreciation of what it took to make even the simplest iron implement. You know, forget about steel, forget about anything else, you know, of like, like a digging tool or something like that. Um, it really made me appreciate how valuable finished tools or anything made of iron was uh, in uh, historic times. When you consider that the average yield from a Roman smelter was about 25 pounds, that tells you a lot. And I, I can tell you from personal observation, there wasn't much in the way of ornamental iron in Roman architecture. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until the Middle Ages when they really figured out how to make smelt iron in volume. Um, I've got a question for you, Phil. Um, mm -hmm. The original uh, kind of bloom that you started with, mm -hmm. where, where did you get your hands on that? I, I, I just, I might have missed it, but like, where did that come from? It was given to me by Lee Souter. He, he sent me, it was a part of a bloom. It wasn't the whole thing. And it was about four pounds. And so was so, that a bloom that he had made? Like, yes. I guess that's what I'm wondering is like, where, where did that bloom first start? No, Lee, Lee smelted it himself. He, the, Lee, Lee's done a lot of smelting. He's, I don't, there might be somebody else who's done as much in the U.S., but I don't think so. Um, so Phil, do we know what he smelted it from? Yeah, he, he has a limonite. He lives in Western Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, and he has a local source for limonite. Okay. Okay. And the thing is, uh, okay, South Jersey, which I'm very familiar with because my mom's family came from there, um, was one of the early iron making centers. For the for the colonies and the United the early United you know the, the young republic and bacteria there's a certain type of bacteria the iron fixing bacteria and they will pull iron from minerals and from plant material and concentrate it and this is how they make the living is by oxidizing iron and. You can see, and, and actually had, it, and then they, it sort of gets mixed with sand. Uh, they, they line pools of water 
and you can see like this line of of iron rich material around this pool and if they do this for long enough then you have a layer of very very high iron uh mixed with sand usually silica and that is bog iron if it dries out and gets subducted and metamorphized then you have limonite Phil, the, the, the material around the uh, bolster of your knife, uh, can you tell us what that is? Oh, okay, it's a ferrule. And um, I tend to like to make narrow, my narrow tang blades with ferrules. Okay. Because it keeps the, uh, the wood from splitting. Yeah, no, I, I know what, what is it made out of. It's mocha megane. Oh. And that particular mocha megane is sterling silver, copper, and 5% Shibuichi. Oh, okay. Uh, in what's called Banha pattern. Ah, thank you. And it's, it's one of the types of mocha man I make. Thank you. Uh, Phil, Bryson's asking if you ever Rockwell tested this blade um, or... <laughs> no, I don't. And the reason is, is because I do not have a Rockwell tester. And what I'm more interested in is performance than an actual number. And so I have performance tests that I do to tell me if the blade is going to do what I want it to do. My main concern is it being too hard or too soft. <clears throat> if it's too hard, <clears throat> given a certain edge geometry, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> then the edge will flake or chip. If it's too soft, it'll fold or um, wear pretty quickly. <clears throat> if so, I tend, when I'm doing this, I tend to start out with the blade too hard, test it, and then gradually soften it until I get the performance that I want. If I never get the performance I want, it means that the blade has, most likely the blade has been overheated Okay, and and the crystal structure is too large and it'll never be any good, in which case I'll throw it out. That's that's just how I do it. Um, Rockwell can be really handy for telling you if you're in the ballpark. Uh, but I don't know how much a Rockwell tester costs. The last time I looked, it was like about four grand. And um, for four grand, I'll, I'll, I'll continue with the empirical testing because you can have a great Rockwell number, and if your crystalline structure is no good, the blade won't perform. And remember, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of replicate the historic mine here, and they didn't have this stuff, but they produced some really, really fine tools. Earlier in the presentation, you and Dave were talking, and you used the term hot short. Mm. Um, and I, I've heard that term a few times, but I just gotta be honest, I don't really know what it means. Um, what are you guys talking about with that? You'll know it when you see it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, hot short means is you're, okay, you put a piece of mild steel in the fire and you know bring it out, it's a nice sort of orangey yellow, start beating on it, draws out, right? No problem. If it's hot short, if it's really badly hot short, it'll start to crumble, okay? If it's only a little bit badly hot short, you start to get cracks perpendicular to the direction of the draw. And it has nothing to do with the way you're hammering it or anything like that. It's that the material is no good. And sulfur tends to be, is, is, is the usual culprit. Um, if you want to, see, if you want to see hot short in a big way, get a piece of cast iron, throw it in your forge, get it to a nice heat and beat on it. Have you ever done that? Kelly? Um, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I, I am very familiar with the moment you said cast iron. It broke up, right? It really does. Yeah. It just, it just falls that, all apart. That's hot short <laughs> in a big way. Cold um, short, cold short will happen with high phosphorus material and some other stuff 
where you 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 go ahead and, and cold work it. And a lot of iron has been cold worked, like look at armor, you know, and sheet metal work. Um, and it'll it'll do the same thing, it'll crack. I mean, you should be able to take a piece of decent iron and draw it to half its original thickness without having it crack when you know cold, of course. And if it does crack, it's probably high phosphorus. Al's Al asking um, if you could tell us more about the high phosphorus iron you've experimented with and what exactly you're trying to achieve with it. I haven't gotten very far with the high phosphorus iron. What I did was I got a bloom from Lee Souter of high phosphorus iron and I folded and welded it to the point where it's starting to work like a you know, reasonably solid piece of metal. And the intent is to combine it with, you know, forge into a strip and combine it with high carbon steel, cement and iron, just like I showed, you know, for making this knife. And the idea is that the phosphorus will block the car carbon from migrating into it. Okay, one of the problems with pattern welding of, car of, of simple steels is that the carbon migrates very quickly when it's hot. And, and, but at the same time you have in historic pieces, very clear pattern welding, no fuzziness in it. And how did they do that? And the, the heterogeneous quality of pattern welded seals is very important because it, it's, uh, they're tougher up to a certain point. If it's really fine grain, they're not tougher, but if the grain is relatively coarse, they are tougher than homogeneous steels. And uh, it's just a little historic uh, investigation on my part, since I already have something which is superior to that, which is 9% nickel steel and carbon steel, which is what I use for my pattern welding material. Uh, you know, like the Javanese, Chris, same, same materials. Yeah, but I really like to see if I can do this. Bill, are you on Instagram? No, I don't do social media. Sorry. Good for, Good for you. Thank you. But anybody who wants to contact me, art for us at Comcast.net. And I think I can speak for everyone when I say not just thank you for this presentation, but um, super hopeful and looking forward to Swaptoberfest and that it is like going to be a safe, good, fun time for everyone and can't wait to see um, your demonstration there. Yeah, I, I'm really, uh, I can't wait to see, see, see my friends, you know, it's like, it's been, it's been pretty grim for the past year or so. You know, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'll be there and I'll have a bunch of tools with me that I no longer need. Uh, well, if there's no further questions, I think we might all just say a very like deeply felt thank you, Phil, for sharing with us. And Thanks, Phil. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. And uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you in October.